Well, uh, welcome everyone to CG's um, CG webinar number, um, I'm not quite sure, we're in the 300s anyway. Uh, it's really good to see you and um, see everyone coming in. And today we've got with us Antonin Chirat, who's going to talk to us about his doctoral study on um, the, the process of building European um, University Alliances a rhizomatic analysis of the European University's Initi initiative and he'll tell us about rhizomatic analysis as we go. Uh, Antonin is a, a doctoral student in the Department of Education at the University of Oxford and been a great contributor to our teaching program as well as to the research community. Um, I recommend his study to you highly and I hope you enjoy today's webinar. Before I, uh, I invite Antonin in, let me take you through the webinar protocols. Remember that the webinar is being recorded. So it, it, uh, everything you say and do in the chat and also on screen will be recorded for all time. You'll be able to see the webinar within the next 24 hours or so on our YouTube channel, which you can access through the CG website. Now, during the webinar, uh, we advise you to keep your mic silent and also turn your camera off because it both of those things help us to conduct the webinar with less distractions. Um, but uh, we advise you to turn your mic on when you come into the Q&A session, most important to be audible at that stage. Uh, we suggest that you use the speaker view um, command in the top right corner there with the red arrow, because that helps you to see who's speaking at any given time. Now, to enter the webinar uh, in the Q&A section, which will start about halfway through, Indicate to me in the chat, to all of us, in fact, what you want to ask or what you want to say. And I'll select the participants for the Q&A section on the basis of what's coming through in the chat. So it's a good idea to raise your question for Antonin early, even towards the end of his presentation, certainly soon after that, because your chances of getting into the Q&A are much greater if you come in early. If you come in in the last 10 minutes, we often find that there's a, a line of people waiting and, and you miss out with your, with your no doubt excellent comment or question at that point. So come in early. Um, when, you're, when I invite you to speak, and I'll send you a little note in the chat just to warn you it's coming. When I invite you to speak, um, turn on your mic, uh, turn on your camera and introduce yourself and say where you're from and then give us your question or your statement. Antonin, at this stage, the screen is yours and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Simon. Let me just share my screen. Yeah, we can see that. Thanks, Antonin. Perfect. Oh, sorry, went a little bit ahead. <laughs> All right, yeah, uh, great. Thank you so much, Simon, for, for the introduction um, and for inviting me to speak here today. And thank you everybody who's, uh, who's joined in. So as Simon mentioned, I'll be presenting on uh, the European Universities Initiative, uh, which is the topic of my current doctoral research. Uh, however, this presentation is specifically on an article um, that I published with Maya Cheng Saliani over the summer, um, which was based on my master's research, which was a bit of a prequel uh, to my doctoral research. So the idea of this uh, presentation is to introduce you all to the European Universities Initiative and also hopefully uh, give you a sense of what we tried to deploy in our article uh, conceptually, making use of a rhizomatic analysis to study the alliances of the European Universities Initiative. Um, but right before I get into rhizomes and uh, philosophy, I think it's a good idea to give you a little bit of a sense of what the European Universities Initiative is and where it comes from. Um, so most of the stakeholders I have interviewed, when I asked them what is the origin and the start of the initiative, usually dated back um, to a speech, a speech by Emmanuel Macron in 2017, um, which he gave at the Sorbonne shortly after his election as president of France, uh, in which he spoke about his vision for the future of the European Union. 
And it's a fairly long speech, but there's a small section in it which uh, discusses education and higher education more specifically, where he mentions that he would like to see the creation of European universities uh, by 2024. He mentions that he'd like to see 20 universities being created by then. And it's a bit mysterious what these European universities are at that point, what they, what they mean, but we'll get into that uh, a little bit later. Shortly after the, your, the, the speech was given, the European Commission um, ordered a report on the state of transnational cooperation uh, between higher education institutions throughout the European Union and deployed a rather large survey uh, throughout the wider higher education landscape in the European Union to see what were the obstacles with transnational cooperation um, at the moment. And what they found uh, from the responses of higher education institutions was that the biggest obstacles was ob obviously funding, but the second and probably most interesting obstacle is administrative and legal barriers. And you would have thought that with the Bologna process and the creation of the European higher education area, a lot of administrative and legal barriers would have diminished or uh, become in existence in regards to transnational cooperations between higher education institutions throughout the European Union. However, that's really not the case. And more widely, when I interview quite a lot of stakeholders at different levels in my current doc doctoral research, uh, one thing which comes up is that the Bologna tools aren't correctly performing and aren't working efficiently enough. And tools such as the European approach for quality assurance of joint programs uh, aren't being fully deployed uh, by member states, which is creating a lot of uh, obstacles towards proper transnational cooperation. So one of the purposes of the European Universities Initiative, as it was imagined by the European Commission, was to find a way to resolve some of these issues. And the main idea of this initiative is to strengthen the international visibility and competitiveness of European higher education institutions, to strengthen European culture, identity, and solidarity, and be able through this to facilitate interinstitutional collaboration between higher education institutions throughout the European Union. And it's sets out some pretty ambitious objectives, which are to transform the higher education landscape in the European Union by creating these European universities. But what are really these European universities? And I know I've left you uh, with this question since Macron's speech, and what does the European Commission really mean by them? Now, before I answer this question, I think it's good to have a little refresher on what the treaties actually say in regards to higher education. As many of you will know, education is a supporting competence of European Union institutions, which means that all they can do is encourage cooperation between member states and the higher education institutions found between the member states, and only support, complement, or supplement the actions which, is be which are being led uh, in education um, by the member states always by respecting the full responsibility and the sovereignty of member states uh, and their education systems. And this is something that uh, you will see if you look at the policy documents regarding the initiative and any education, a European education initiative more widely is that the sovereignty of their member states and their education systems is absolutely key and fundamental. So what can the European Commission do to create European universities if it doesn't have the legal, legal competence in regards to education. Well, if you look at it, debates on the creation of a European university are pretty much as old as the EU itself. Uh, they can be traced back since the start of the European community and the signature of the original treaties of Rome, but never has a treaty been created to give uh, EU institutions that competence to be able to create a European university that would be dependent on uh, an EU institution, such as the Commission, for example. So how can the Commission bypass that? Well, what they've done is to try to stick within the realm of the treaties, which can only give it the possibility to encourage cooperation between member states and the higher education institutions. And so what it calls European universities are transnational alliances, collaborative partnerships, which are made up of four to 12 higher education institutions, which are meant to really represent the full geographical diversity of the European Union, with HEIs from the north, south, east, and west, west of the European Union, and participating Erasmus Plus and Horizon 20 countries. And in order to deploy this, 
Um, the commission launched two pilot phases, one in 2019 and one in 2020, where 41 alliances were selected, which englobe nearly 300 higher education institutions throughout the European Union, representing this full geographical uh, diversity as much as possible, with each alliance receiving a budget uh, for up to four years of 7 million um, euros split between Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020. Now, those of you here who will be familiar with the initiative will know that a third pilot phase has been launched and the results were announced in July 2022. Uh, however, my PhD started a bit before this, so you'll excuse me if I focus on uh, just the first two pilot phase in the framework of this study. And I mentioned the full geographic Geographical diversity uh, of the higher education landscape in the European Union being represented. But one of the purposes of this initiative is really to englobe and represent the full diversity of the higher education landscape in regards to institutional forms, institutional histories, and whatnot. And you'll see this within these 41 alliances, which have very different forms, very different objectives, and very different histories. Some of these alliances are made up only of large research intensive universities. Others will be made up of non-comprehensive universities with a strong disciplinary focus. Others will be have formed because they have a very um uh, they have a very, they have some strong similarities, such as being universities situated in coastal areas of the of the European Union, uh, of non capital cities. Others will be alliances of universities of applied sciences, and others will have formed because they have a very strong sense of linguistic uh, proximity, such as the Unita Alliance, which was formed only with higher education institutions in countries of Romance languages. So there is this idea of really representing the full diversity of the higher education landscape through these alliances. And this is why the commission decided while launching this initiative to not have a one model fits all system where one alliance should resemble a certain form. Um, what it tries to do is give the possibility of to alliances to experiment through a, what it calls a bottom-up process. And I know some of you may laugh when hearing a bottom-up process coming from the European Commission, because obviously this is a competitive call, which uh, gives, which, which, which forces alliances to uh, respect a certain amount of guidelines and a certain amount of rules. So how can this be completely bottom-up? Well, it does leave a few loose ends and a, a bit of uh, experimental um, possibilities to the alliances that have been selected. Um, and it expects them to really ask, act as test beds for, um, for the future of higher education uh, in the European Union to experiment with these different forms and also to find some of the solutions with some of the original problems that it identified. Remember this report that I spoke to you about at the very beginning of this presentation. The Commission identified some obstacles towards transnational cooperation and it's put on the shoulders of these alliances the responsibility of finding some innovative, innovative ways to be able to find some answers to them to in order to facilitate transnational cooperation in the future um, in the European Union. And to go back on bottom-up processes just a little bit, uh, prior to the start of the initiative, um, the European Commission did a co-consultation uh, process, a co-creation process of the first call, where it invited some key uh, higher education stakeholders in the European Union to be able to share their thoughts on what such an initiative should look like um, and what was the state of transnational cooperation uh, in the European Union. So when Maya and I started working on this, uh, on this initiative, we really realized that there was a big diversity of alliances which were uh, being created with this very strong sense of experimentation for these alliances. And with this idea of experimentation and alliances, we were looking at ways to analyze, analyze these, uh, these new European universities. And one concept ca came to mind, which continuously speaks about experimentation and continuously speak about alliance and alliance making. And that's the concept of rhizomes. Now, before I go into the conceptual free features of the rhizome, I wanted to remind you all what a rhizome actually is. And it's something which is found in the natural world. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen rhizomes. You probably have rhizomes uh, all in your own backyards right now. Uh, and a rhizome is the thick stem of some plants, such as the iris and mint, that grows along or under the ground and has roots and stems growing from it. Now, I put some little illustrations of uh, some rhizomes you, you may know. You may recognize ginger and bamboo. 
There's a key feature about um, rhizomes, which really differentiates it from a tree or a plant, is that it grows horizontally and it doesn't have one fixed original point. When you take a tree, for example, obviously it grows vertically and it's very clear that there's an origin, original uh, point from which uh, branches stem from and where roots stem from as well. In rhizomes, it's quasi impossible to figure out where is the actual original point and what is the origin of a rhizome. You could take any of the points of the rhizome, which could be its origin, and it grows horizontally on the surface of the ground. And this is something that interested us uh, quite a lot. And this is something which really sprung the idea of creating a concept uh, of out of rhizomes from uh, Gilles Deleuze and Félix Gattari, who are uh, the, the inventors of this uh, concept. And I use inventors not lightly because Deleuze and Gattari, as, as many of you will know, have this vision of philosophy uh, and philosophers as people who create concepts, uh, like artists create artworks. It's the duty of the philosopher to create concepts. And there's very much always in their philosophy, this idea of using concepts and creating concepts, which offer the possibility of thinking about the world with the world. Beyond rhizomes, my background is in film studies, for example, and reading Deleuze's works on cinema, uh, he compares the film image to a crystal, uh, something which is a fractal nature. So continuously, if you familiarize yourself with Deleuzean language, you will always find that there are some concepts which stem directly from the world, which are meant to facilitate our understanding of the world with it. There's a lot of debates about where the actual concept was uh, originally used from, and uh, many scholars have considered that uh, the concept actually finds its roots in the work of Gregory Batson, who was um, studying Yatmo tribes. And um, the first time that he uses the concept of rhizome, or actually this idea of a tribe or a community operating as a rhizome, is that he considers that communities should not be seen as closed systems. Actually, they're entities which are infinitely proliferating, that are subdividing, which are continuously expanding. If you have some members of a community which go in another part of a territory, they will establish another community and continuously grow, establish itself outwards in a, in a completely um, never-ending fashion. And this is, brings Batson to, under, to say that a uh, Yatmo community operates like the rhizome of the lotus. And this idea of series of divisions and expansions creates trajectories, trajectories of these tribes that Batteson um, identifies, but also trajectories even in a biological term of, uh, of the rhizomatic um, uh, features. And I use this idea of trajectories because this is really going to be the start of how Deleuze and Gattari use the concept in their philosophy. The first time that the concept uh, appears in their, in their work is uh, when they discuss the work of Franz Kafka. Uh, it's an introductory chapter, and uh, Deleuze and Gattari speak about two works by Kafka, uh, The Castle and The Man Who Disappears, um, where in each of the works, a character is faced with an entity, uh, in one a castle and in another a very big hotel, with a multiplicity of doors, of entrances. And what there isn't, and the character does not know through which entrance he should be uh, entering uh, the building. And what Deleuze and Gattari say is that it doesn't really actually matter by which entrance uh, the character enters the building. What's important is the connections that the character is going to draw between the entrance and his destination from point A to point B. What's interesting is understanding how a character is going to use an entrance to then go through a hallway, through a corridor, to a room, and further on. It creates a map, a trajectory of the character, which can continuously be modified considering the choices of the character and considering what point the character is entering in. But the actual entrance doesn't matter at all. It doesn't have any uh, sorts of importance. What's important is for us to create maps, cartographies. And this is really where the, con the concept deploys itself. A rhizome is a cartography, but not a finite cartography. It's a cartography which is in the middle. Antonioli, who speaks of the concept of the rhizome, speaks of it, of cartography, as a practice of imagination, which resorts on the imaginary. And she draws on the example of Christopher Columbus, who, going to America, um, discovering America, 
created maps before his actual trip. The maps weren't actually uh, created uh, once he arrived in the America, but there was an imaginative process of imagining what was there, what could be there of that trajectory to, to India's at the time. And the idea of these new routes, of creating these new routes, of creating these cartographies, gives the idea of a maps not as a mimicry of an existing territory, but as a representation, not as a representation, but as a tool for experimentation and creation. And this is really where the concept finds its roots. And with this idea of experimentation, of creation, of cartography, we found that it could be an interesting way to analyze the alliances of the European Universities Initiative. And in order to do so, we looked a little more closely about at what Deleuze and Guattari do with the concept. And the concept is actually articulated around six general principles that you'll see on your screen here. And we were interested in understanding how these six general principles could be used as analytical tools, which could give us the possibility of giving a, getting a better understanding about what was happening in the framework of the construction of the alliances of the European Universities Initiative. I'll go through these concepts uh, a little bit and show you how we try to operationalize them uh, to understand these alliances and show you a bit of uh, results that we found uh, from them. So the first two are really the, the, the foundational pillars of what a rhizome is, is that a rhizome has, uh, has the purpose of creating alliances, creating connections, and connections between heterogeneous components. Uh, a rhizome can be composed of an infinite number of components, which can be of completely different nature. And what's important with the rhizome, as you'll remember when I showed you the pictures of the bamboo and the ginger, is that it grows horizontally. There's no sense of hierarchy anymore, like you can find in the root uh, or, in, or in a tree. What's important is continuously connecting one point to the next. However heterogeneous the point is to the next, and however unhierarchical they can be. Exactly like what I discussed about Kafka a bit later. What matters is not so much what entrance you take, it's what points you're connecting to the next and what cartography you're growing. And we consider that a rhizome can be composed of people, institutions, concepts, or physical spaces. I imagine you can get a sense of where we're going with the potential application in higher education research with this. We consider that an alliance, like a higher education institution, is made up of students, academics, the higher education institutions, EU institutions, national governance, virtual and physical spaces, but also the wider landscape of what makes a higher education alliance with partnerships with NGOs, enterprises, um, and, 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 and the public sector more widely. And we consider that it's the interaction between these different heterogeneous components that make up an EUI alliance. And it's important to remind that also, although an alliance is made up of these heterogeneous components, each alliance is also heterogeneous one uh, between the others. As you'll have seen when I showed you the 41 alliances, they're extremely different in their purposes and what they're made up of, be it universities of applied sciences or research intensive universities. And the idea is that they're also all connected between each other through this initiative. So the whole European Universities Initiative is a rhizome in itself, made up of these alliances, which are themselves subdivided again into these heterogeneous components, which are students, academics, HEIs, et cetera, like the Yatmo tribes that Bateson uh, describes, which is continuously subdividing into um, different connections and different uh, components. And you can see this very clearly uh, from the start of the initiative. One of the first things that the commission did when the 41 alliances were launched was creating some pretty basic fact sheets. Now, we use these fact sheets just as a very basic uh, point of reference, but if you look at them, it's, it's interesting because you really see the diversity of what they're made of. They're made up of what it calls pioneers, the higher education institutions, Associate members, which uh, you'll see for some of them can be chambers of commerce, NGOs, enterprises, um, or whatnot, the students, the academic staff, research groups, really this whole uh, diversity which, which make up these alliances. And they're all interconnected between each other and are all participating in different ways in building uh, these alliances. The third concept, and I think this is quite an interesting one, is a signifying rupture. Now, this may be a tricky term when you hear it from the first uh, the first point, but what we try to understand with a signifying rupture is understanding how each alliance um, is 
is um, connected to both pre-existing structures and entirely new ones. Um, what means, but what the concept actually means is that the rhizome is capable of being shattered in any point. Remember that it doesn't really matter where a rhizome starts or where a rhizome ends. It has no beginning or end. And when I told, when I showed you the pictures of the bamboo or the ginger, you can see that finding its original points is uh, is very difficult, or where it's going. What we saw is that the alliances of the pilot phase are in the middle. They're creating European universities, new European universities, which haven't been built yet and that are very much in the making. But they also stem from something. The alliances don't come out of the blue, as uh, Anne Corbett uh, said in her uh, famous book on European uh, universities. Um, and we found this very quickly when we looked a little bit deeper at how the alliances were formed. What we saw is that all the alliances that we uh, we saw came from some sort of previous partnerships. And speaking to a lot of stakeholders, there's this idea of trust, which was very important in setting up these, uh, these alliances. Now, Previous partnerships means very different things. Some of these alliances came from transnational university networks, like the Coimbra Group, the League of European Research Universities, um, or uh, the guilds. Others were really just had a strong history of university to university partnerships. Uh, others had research partnerships, Erasmus agreements, and others were much more simply just uh, individual academics that were used to working together in different higher education institutions and who wanted to take part in the project. One thing that we realized out of the 31 alliances we introduced out of the 41 is that 15 came from past networks, however diverse these networks could be, and 16 came from past bilateral links individual bilateral links, research partnerships, or uh, university to university partnerships. And I've just shown two examples of two uh, alliances here to show you a little bit how they're constructed. So the UGLO Alliance, which is the European University Alliance for Global Health, um, you can see that all the, the higher education institutions participating in this alliances are someone linked through uh, three main networks. So the League of European Research Universities, CESAR, and uh, the S group, which is formerly the Santander group. And the fact that each alliance started drawing some connections and while they were building this alliance and these partnerships were thinking, huh, who could we speak to and who are we used to working with? They immediately turned back toward, towards these alliances. And when I spoke to stakeholders uh, in UGLO, participation in particularly the League of European Research Universities was very much something that brought a climate of trust uh, and quality to uh, to a lot of the other participating um, higher education institutions in setting up the alliance. Now, this is for the case of university networks, but the case of Civica, uh, so the European University of Social Sciences, is a bit different. And although you'll see some uh, university networks which are present here, like the Global Public Policy Network or the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, what was highlighted in our discussions, uh, in our interviews, was bilateral links, mainly joint degrees, Erasmus agreements, and some privileged research partnerships between the, the institutions. And I'll insist on joint degrees because it's one of the alliances which had a, one of the largest histories in regards to joint degrees between its participating members. And this is really what was key in order to uh, fostering this alliance. So just to sum up a signifying rupture, there's this idea that these, diff these different past partnerships, however varied in their form, were really the roots in building these pilot phase alliances, which will then create a new entity, which are these European universities. So really remember that all of these alliances as they are now are very much in the middle, like a rhizome. Multiplicity is the fourth principle of the rhizome, and it's what we find really makes rhizo rhizomatic analysis quite singular uh, as opposed to, um, to a traditional network analysis. And one thing that we see with a rhizomatic analysis and with the concept of multiplicity is that a rhizome is creating lines rather than points. It's drawing some, uh, not some connections, but it's drawing some objectives, some perspectives, and there are very different objectives which are being created by uh, these alliances. Remember trajectories, that's exactly what it is. Doesn't matter through which entrance you're taking, you're going to analyze the rhizome, but what we do see is that each choice of each alliances are creating novel trajectories, which really make up its difference. And I can give you some pretty concrete examples of different objectives that the alliances have set themselves. 
There's one pretty big debate which has come up um, in recent years regarding the European Universities Initiative is, should we be creating new instruments for um, facilitating cooperation, transnational cooperation on an EU level, or should we be reinforcing existing ones? I told you at the beginning that one of the realizations was that Bologna tools were not working correctly, but speaking to a lot of stakeholders, some of them will be saying that, well, we should put all of our efforts in actually making sure that they're working. Others uh, at a higher education level, and the commission is proposing this as well, uh, speak, suggest the creation of two new instruments, a legal statute for these alliances, so a, a European legal statute for these uh, European university alliances, and a European degree label. Now, there's a lot of different perspectives from the alliances themselves as what both of these things mean and what is their actual need. So, for example, the European degree label is one of the most flagrant ideas of what are the different perspectives on what a European degree label could mean. Should a European degree only involve the mobility of students in multiple higher education uh, institutions within an alliance? Should it certify students uh, receive classes from an academic from another institution in the alliance without the students having had to actually physically leave their home institution? Should it be a label that reflects quality or Europeanness? One stakeholder even suggested that it should be a hunting tool to attract non-European and international students and facilitate access to the European labor market. And some alliances will actually say that, wait, European degrees aren't actually the future of higher education, and we want to focus on the development of micro-credentials. So within the alliances themselves, although there is this common objective of creating European universities, of transforming the European higher education landscape, there have very different perspectives and very different trajectories to tackle an issue like European degrees. The other big one is the legal entities for these European universities. And at the moment, uh, the alliances don't possess uh, the capacity to deliver degrees, to mutualize resources and personnel, to directly receive funding. So some of them were saying, well, we actually need a legal uh, entity to be able to to achieve these objectives. Now, some alliances have already been um, uh, experimenting with existing national tools, and there are some possible existing EU legal instruments that could be experimented with, like the European Economic Interest Group, so the European Groupings of Territorial Cooperation. And the Commission has just launched a pilot phase uh, this summer alongside uh, a pilot phase on European degrees for uh, inviting alliances to experiment with uh, poss possible legal entities for these European universities. And speaking to the different alliances, it's the same. Some consider that a legal entity is absolutely essential for their development, and otherwise they will, they will shatter to the ground, while others say, well, we've actually managed it so far, and maybe this is not so necessary. So very different perspectives on two big topics which have been coming out of the European Universities Initiative, which constitute what we consider to be a multiplicity and consider it um, rhizomes. So I'll end with two of the most important um, principles of the rhizome, which we've spoken about before, which is cartography. What's important about cartography is that it's made up of all the different components that we discussed beforehand. So connection, heterogeneity, multiplicity and a signifying rupture. And the cartography is the surface upon which all of these different heterogeneous components of the rhizome can create their, these connections, express their most multiplicities and display their origin. But this surface is fresh. It doesn't mimic anything else. And it is really an experimentation. The cartography element of the rhizome is for me really the tool which can give the possibility to understand and analyze the experimentations which are being deployed by the different university alliances. But since Lodos and Guattari hate dichotomies, they don't consider that creating a map and creating experimentations is necessarily in opposition to creating tracings. And that is why the last uh, principle of the rhizome is decalcomania, is that although they consider that a rhizome should make cartographies and be continuously experimenting, like the European University Alliances, they sometimes also create models. And as much as the Commission may say that these are uh, test beds, that they're meant to uh, experiment with the future of European higher education, there's often this idea that comes back as well that they're also trying to create role models for the future of European higher education. And it's the same thing for the two pilot phases that I've just discussed in regards to European degree labels or, um, or, or legal entities. Some alliances were experiments with them and 
hopefully find some results that will be able to be shared and reused by um, the different higher education uh, alliances of the initiative. Um, I will stop right there because I'm out of time, but that's in a nutshell um, the deployment of the concept of the rhizome uh, and a rhizomatic analysis uh, in regards to the European Universities Initiative um, and a brief summary of the initiative. So, yeah, thank you all for your attention. Well done, Anthony. You've provoked very interesting questions uh, already in the chat. Uh, and in fact, we've got um, we've got four which relate to rhizomatic analysis, you know, which which are about it and comparing it to other forms of analysis and so on. Um, I'm going to ask the first one, and I'm going to, going to bring in Marion now and Alexander Mittery, and we've also got Hans DeWitt, and we want to try and get in before he leaves at quarter to um, the hour. My question is about networks. You've started on this already. Contrast between rhizomatic analysis and network analysis. I mean, we know you obviously networks have edges and nodes, uh, and that's that's one difference. But another thing is that we know networks have a kind of growth dynamic which is related to the efficiency of their expansion. That is, each time a network expands, the each 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 point connects to more points, and so the 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 economic cost of extending the network cheapens as you go. So that tends to drive expansion. In what ways it does a rhizome uh, uh, develop differently to a network? Thanks, Simon, for, for the question. It doesn't necessarily develop um, differently from, from, I mean, at least it's it's not so much about how a rhizome develops differently from a network, because if you think about it, a rhizome is, is a network. What interests us is more how a rhizomatic analysis can differ from a social network analysis or mm -hmm. a yeah. standard network analysis. And one thing that we found is that a network analysis is not necessarily appropriate to discuss processes of how the network is actually being built and looking at the different policy discussions which which give the possibility for uh, the network to being built and particularly to look at the experimental features of a network um as i said uh, these are what we're looking at is not necessarily the european universities it itself but the pilot phases of the european universities initiative which are very much about building these new initiative these new alliances and looking at how they can sometimes make wrong turns, meet dead ends, um, sometimes have successes that they'll cele celebrate, but not necessarily look at a picture of a network as it's already been created, but looking mm -hmm. at it as a network as it is in the making. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, I'm going to bring in um, Hans DeWitt. Quickly have to apologize to Marion, who would have been next, but Hans has to leave. So we'll have Hans first, then Marion, and then Alexander. So Hans. Yeah, thank you, Simon, and uh, thank you, Anthony, for a uh, very interesting uh, presentation. And also, your concept of rhizomes is very uh, interesting approach uh, to alliances and networks. Uh, the question is a little bit related to what Simon asked. Uh, it, I mean, the, we know in general that alliances and networks, which are small, are much more effective. Uh, if you make the analysis the rhizomes, uh, uh, if they grow too much, the quality might be deteriorating. Uh, is there not a challenge in uh, that uh, the quality of the the product is uh, deteriorating when uh, the, the the networks come too much? And uh, that's in particular important with this, the third call, where the commission was stimulating to enter more institutions uh, which don't have this historical background that you gave of already being connected to each other. Is there is there not a risk of that? Yeah, thank, thank you for your question. And as you mentioned, and this is something which is coming out of my interviews at the moment, uh, a lot of alliances are rather unhappy that the Commission has pushed for this uh, enlargement as a condition for uh, having access to further funding for the next, uh, for the next six years. Um, nevertheless, I don't think this necessarily undermines the use of a rhizomatic analysis in order to, uh, to, to understand these, uh, these alliances. Um, I also think that what is important about the evolution of these uh, of these alliances is, of course, there's the expansion just on the higher education side, um, which 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 has been quite documented with these with the enlarge, enlargement of these alliances as part of the of the new pilot phase. But there's also the networks that they're growing outside of higher education, and that's something that we've tried to touch about a little bit. Um, 
And this can be with a variety of different actors, be it from uh, NGOs, the private sector, the public sector. And we really realize, speaking to stakeholders, that they're very much reliant on this participation of these stakeholders for their success. And if we were just to stick to two outside of higher education uh, institution stakeholders, I take really national govern governments and um, and European Union institutions. Uh, there isn't currently a governance framework which exists uh, for the deployment of this initiative, which really involve these three uh, different stakeholders. Um, however, they're all aware that the condition of the success of this initiative will be dependent on an actual network or actual governance framework between these three stakeholders uh, in order for it to be effectively deployed. And I think not looking, I think looking be beyond just the alliances as something which contains higher education institutions is key to understanding really the deployment of these uh, of these alliances and, and their future success. I don't know if that, if that makes sense, but. Uh... Well, thank you, yeah. Thank you, Hans, and thank you, Antonin. Uh, uh, next question for Marion. Now, Marion, I think we'll be just on audio. Hi there. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, this is a really stimulating way to kind of conceptualize the kind of interactions between different bodies or individuals. Um, I'm working on a project um, with Christina Hultgren, who I think is also here um, at the Open University, where we're looking at how English is becoming increasingly used for academic programs at European universities. And we're trying to trace causal process processes as well. So we're adopting this kind of methodology called process tracing. But a lot of what you're talking about really resonates with what I'm finding, um, which, you know, a, a question that keeps popping up is how do ideas travel? And you have all these networks and these associations and alliances. You have this alignment of visions um, that goes almost beyond causal process tracing. So my question is, um, if a superordinate category is horizon and the subsumed categories are horizons and there's no beginning and no end, how might one go about tracing causal processes? Well, I mean, you know, I, I don't think that necessarily the fact that there is a never ending nature to to rhizomes doesn't doesn't give the possibility of tracing causal processes. I mean, we've tried to do this when we looked at the origin of the of the alliances. Um, obviously, this can go forever and ever and ever. But being looking at the point which existed right before the formation of these alliances and understanding what were the past links. So mainly participation in uh, university networks or bilateral links uh, for us was a very important uh, step to understanding the formation of these uh, of these alliances. And of course, we could go a step further and then understand where the, the actual university networks or bilateral partnerships uh, come from and eternally, eternally, eternally. But I think you can look at uh, different points. Now, for me, what was important, at least in understanding how the pilot phases of the European Universities Initiative could act as rhizomes, is that understanding how they were in the middle, uh, as you remember, so between two points. And I think maybe for, for your study as well, like there can be something, you can trace a point which is right before and, or at least points, let's say, which are right before and mm -hmm. points which are uh, in the becoming, if that makes sense. I mean, can, you can, can make I an ask... argument. Sorry, um, um, we've, got, we've got a few callers to come, okay. Marion. So, I mean, you can make an argument that um, knowledge, you know, in a field um, develops in a rhizomatic fashion. It doesn't really have a clear cut beginning and an end, but you can you talk about causality when you see flows of ideas between people and, and the way in which they're hybridized and, and, uh, and transformed and, and transmitted. Um, Thanks so much. Thank you. In, I'm going to bring in um, Alexander Mittery at this point, uh, and then I think we might have to bunch some of our contributions. Alexander. Hi, thank you for that great presentation. Um, my question is, when I was looking at those logos of the alliances, I saw much more commonality between the logos than actually divergence and heterogeneity. And I was wondering, um, there has been a, a, a flow of, of new research work around the people from Calon, Michel Calon and others who also build on Deleuze and Qatari's Agence Small, which uh, quite, they kind of do a rhizomatic analysis, but then they switch towards looking for commonalities rather than celebrating the heterogeneity of the world. Um, and they, they look at markets and markets Agence Smalls. Um, but I was wondering, and this 
relates to one of the questions coming below to a degree. Aren't there other forms on the European level which have similar ways of building, of rhizomatically developing? And is there a commonality among them, say the, the competitive region ideas of the European Union or the master, the Bologna process, which was very much bottom up in a lot of institutions? Um, yeah, so is there a commonality um, in that uh, heterogeneity uh, of networks, horizontal networks? That's an interesting question. Uh, the answer is I I don't know because I would need to look at uh, I would look at to need to look at a little bit more detail in all this. I mean I think you can look you can use rhizomes and rhizomes have been used uh, in a variety of ways and I think there's an invitation for it to be used uh, in a variety of ways. I think yeah you could you could look at the just the EU itself and the European uh, construction as as a series of of heterogeneous components which are coming together to trying to build um, a, a new whole. Um, however, yeah, I don't want to get necessarily ahead of myself and give you uh, give you an answer that everything in the EU is uh, is is rhizomatic. You know, if I'm if I'm honest with you, like originally we thought about uh, using rhizomes because there was this idea of alliance and experimentation, but at times while we were developing this conceptual framework and trying to use these six principles, there were moments where we thought, oh, well, actually this isn't rhizomatic. And we had to. We sometimes met dead ends with uh, with the concept, which sometimes found some some contradictions. And uh, as as you say, sometimes we were thinking, oh well, actually, how is it heterogeneous? Because it's all alliances or it's all higher education institutions. And the fact is, we had to look a little bit more closely at both the construction of the higher education institutions and the the construction of these alliances to actually really find. The heterogeneity. So yeah, uh, I think it's an it's an interesting concept to play with, but I think you have to be careful maybe with uh, with applying it to to absolutely everything as well because you you may have some surprises. At the same time, you could argue that uh, a Deleuzean way to look at the concept would be not to use uh, the six principles as something completely dogmatic and that we should actually break them, contour, like go around them, and uh, and so it doesn't really matter. So yeah. <laughs> It's a shame we can't wish away hierarchy um, <laughs> just by simply imposing concepts on, on it all. Um, I'm going to bring in Tim Gore next. Um, Tim. Hello, Tim. Um, Tim's not coming in straight away, although we had, a, I think, a, a chat in the email. Hello. In, the, in the chat, there he is. Hello, Tim. Hey, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't please ask your question. Absolutely. Uh, and it's really interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I've got a bamboo thicket in my garden. And as, as you know, bamboo is extremely invasive and just sort of it duplicates itself in all directions. So the way you control that is you dig a trench around it. And that's, you know, and that's so taking your organic model, thinking about trenches and barriers. I mean, Brexit, in a, in, in, to a certain extent, imposed... Um, a limit on some of the trusts that have been there before between relationships and, and also impose a lot of difficulty. Is, is this a, analysis helpful in, in looking at some of those difficulties created by barriers that have come up like Brexit or like changes in government that, that become less progressive potentially in some European countries? Um, what, what do you think about that? I think Brexit is a is is a pretty big topic when you're looking at the European Universities Initiative more uh, more widely. Um, one thing that I have seen, though, I have to say, uh, originally when I started this uh, this this research, it was in 2019, so right before Brexit was effective. And I know some uh, English institutions had been associated to to some alliances. There was already this this fear of um, of losing the. Of, of losing the capacity to be associated in these uh, alliances. And in uh, summer 2020, uh, the fact that uh, the UK left uh, Erasmus uh, or meant no more access to this Erasmus plus funding, uh, which meant no more access to these European universities. Um, however, this would be a barrier. But what we've seen, or at least what I've seen so far, is that participating higher education institutions from the UK in these alliances 
or actually finding ways around these barriers and trying to be creative in order to maintain these connections and drawing new connections. Now, this may mean that rather than being full members, they become associate members. Uh, that means members which may not receive the funding but still participate in the construction of these alliances. Others may found some legal loopholes, uh, I, I believe uh, may join some associations under Belgian law in order to continue being a part of the alliances, even if they don't directly receive uh, themselves the Erasmus Plus funding. So I think with Brexit, in the framework of the of the initiative, particularly, what we've seen is actually some creative ways of deploying new connections, uh, rather than some expected barriers uh, that we could have uh, could have originally expected. Yeah, some of the bamboo gets over the trench, I've noticed. Yes. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, let me now bring in two questioners, because we're beginning to run out of time. The, the, that'll be Simon Gourney and Miguel, Miguel Lim. Simon, you're first. Hi, thanks so much uh, again for the fascinating talk. Uh, I will have a question and also a perspective I can provide, uh, having been kind of the organizer of one of these pilot projects which developed in the very much in the rhizomatic fashion that you talked about into a European project uh, that uh, I just so I just found the model to fit really neatly and I just wanted to make that as a comment then to ask the question also it's not a European universities project but it is effectively in the same area it's a transnational education collaboration uh, and then we have to now, having experienced the kind of the growth of this rhizome into something with a lot of funding and with a lot of development, how this can be best kind of spilt over into the wider community. So we'd like the, the, the rhizome to kind of continue to grow organically and for students maybe to participate and access the resources from outside of the network. And I don't know as much or... Well, I know little about whether the European universities actually also try to do this or whether they're quite, whether they try to sort of co constrain the borders of the growth, if you like. Uh, do you know? Hold your answer, Antonin. Uh, we'll bring in Miguel at this point. Miguel. Hi, Miguel. Miguel Lim. Hello, Miguel. Hmm, could be a bit, could be a lost connection there, Antonin. So, if you could reply to Simon, that would be good. Yeah. So, uh, in regards to holding off the the borders of of this growth, I think as was mentioned uh, a bit before, there's actually a tendency right now. Well, more than a tendency is that the European Commission has asked the European University Alliances to expand themselves. Um, and actually, they've set this as a condition in order to receive a further funding for, for the coming years. So there is an expectation that they will grow. However, I don't think that's necessarily the what, what, what you're asking is, and I see it more as, can the European Universities Initiative actually exist beyond uh, the framework which has been set up by the, the European Commission, and more importantly, beyond the funding which is being attributed at the moment? Because there is... A very, I think everybody will see a very strong dynamic of experimentation, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of energy, maybe too much energy for individuals sometimes that being put uh, into these um, into these into these alliances. Um, but they're completely dependent at the moment on uh, on some EU funding. And the problem is is that if this funding stops, if there's a stop, if there's for some reason a, a change of uh, political will to support this initiative or to bring this initiative uh, forward, there's a big chance that it will stop. So what will come, what will become of these, uh, of these alliances? Would they be able to sustain themselves on their own? The answer is, I don't necessarily know, but I do have one answer, which may start to answer your question, is that as I said, um, the European Universities Initiative was a competitive call. So although 41 alliances were selected, many more applied. Um, and what we have seen is that there are some alliances which decided to continue as alliances despite not receiving the EU funding and to actually continue this dynamic of trying to experiment in collaboration without having the stamp of the EU, the EU funding, which makes it difficult, of course, uh, more difficult for them. But it does demonstrate that there is a possibility to 
work and live as an alliance uh, beyond just the framework of, uh, of EU funding. And I haven't done extensive research on these non-funded alliances, although I think it would be really interesting. And it would be interesting to see even for probably the, the future of the initiative and the future of the alliances. So yeah, I hope I answered your question a little bit. No, certainly. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating to be on the kind of on the seeing it from now from the outside from someone who's researched um 41 or 30 or however many uh, different alliances and also to have been on the inside of it so it's really nice to uh, have both perspectives so thank you thank you uh, Anthony I've been struggling with Miguel's connection uh, and he's been in and out but um I'll read his question um, which you can also see in the chat uh he says for he's got two questions actually he said first he said it's about methodology he says um your presentation was was focused on the rhizomatic concept rather than the case of the EU, he thought. Um, in your analysis, was your approach, did you begin with the concept of rhizomes or did the concept arise after gathering the data on the Euro European universities? And the second question is, what role was there for pre-existing networks beyond the EU in this European rhizomatic process? Um, so I'll answer if your first your first uh, question. Like yes, of course, this presentation was focused a lot more on the rhizomatic concept rather than uh, than actual actual results. Um, also, because I presented this paper, as I mentioned, which was part on, of our my master's research, which was a very small empirical uh, study. I didn't have very many interviews at the time, and tried to find a way to to make. Uh, to make it more uh, lively and more interesting through through the deployment of this uh, of this concept. So the idea was really of this presentation was more presenting the concept and showing the start of some results of my of my PhD. Um, and uh, yeah, so actually, as as I said, we immediately when we started hearing about alliances, experimentations, this was before um, the actual whole data collection. It was more reading the policy uh, documents which were around it, and these words were really coming up uh, all the time. So we kind of had a hint that possibly rhizomes could be a way to, to look at them, uh, but it's only once we had the data that then we had the idea of really looking at the six principles a little bit more in detail uh, and really applying it at such. So I'd say it's a bit, it's a bit of both. And um, Pre-existing beyond EU networks or ties, uh, I I haven't seen any. It tends it tends to be quite uh, it's been it's been quite uh, EU focused. Um, I mean, obviously there are some of these big networks uh, like the the Coimbra Group, which goes beyond the EU. So I guess if you consider that this is a beyond EU network. Uh, then yes, <laughs> but I think it's it tends to be very much uh, very much EU focused. Thanks, Hanson, and, and, and thank Miguel for your question. Um, Pete Leahy, you have the last question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, wonderful presentation. I'd just like to know whether you've looked at the spread of the academic university from the high medieval period through this rhizomatic analysis. I have not. I have not. Uh, I don't. Is this something you would recommend? It could be interesting. I mean, you get some some very interesting um, some very interesting processes of of um, yeah of imitation and of differentiation and uh, it's it's I think it's quite ros rosomatic. Yes. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, I'll I'll look into it. Thanks for thank you so much for suggesting this. And 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 I think we're just about a close point. So, Antonin, I think you've put rhizomatic analysis on the map for us uh, and there will be there will be results from that I think you know all of us who've been involved in this webinar have been persuaded that this is a pretty useful tool um, certainly um, it can explain quite a lot of things and a nice antidote to the rankings view of the world you know which is not a bad thing to have um, so uh, I think you know we, we, we'd like to hear from you again uh, I think when you finish the doctorate um, especially and you've got, you know, you've got your data in full shape um, to see that picture that you can describe using rhizomatic analysis of the networks of European universities will be really good to have. Um, folks, we've got one more webinar for uh, calendar year 2022. Kazuhiro Kudo uh, on Thursday is going to talk about language and intercultural student interactions 
insights from a cosmopolitan agency perspective, like a lot of us, he's working on agent, student agency and in, in intercultural context. Um, next year, in January, we're going to spend the whole month um, talking about the humanities and the arts. We've got a special webinar series of six successive webinars looking at the debates around the role and the nature of the humanities and the arts, uh, liberal arts, East and West, uh, the questions about employability of graduates coming from those programs, uh, or whether that's a useful debate at all, um, all those issues. And um, uh, we've got a, a, a broad range of speakers from all over the world contributing to that discussion. But, um, you know, thanks for giving us such a high quality webinar today, Antonin, and we really look forward to, to seeing the, as I said before, the, the results of your doctoral study. Thank um, you, thanks everyone for being here and come back in two days time. And meanwhile, it's bye for now.